Thanks very much for joining us this afternoon. We're not going to spend hours of your time. We're very aware that everyone watches a lot of webinars and, and time is precious and webinars are numerous. So we're going to nail this um, as quickly and effectively as we can. Um, but before we start, I just wanted to introduce the people who are with me on this webinar um, so you know who, who they are, and then we'll come back and, and, and explain a bit more about what we're going to do, and then we'll get into the meat and potatoes of it. So um, working from left to right, uh, Niels, do you want to introduce yourself? Thanks, Rupert. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Niels. I look after uh, the pro video consultancy business for Adobe in the UK um, for some 11 years now, man and boy. Uh, so I'm the tech geek who, who looks after post-production workflows um and i guess alex next or yes depends alex. which order uh, yes he's, he's next yeah uh, hi alex. hi everyone i'm alex snelling i'm going to be um talking to you um at length actually in quite a while so i'll make this very brief i'm a filmmaker and an editor and um i've done a lot of video training over the years as well but i'm specifically going to be talking about using productions and lucid link on uh, a film documentary of mine Fantastic. Thank you, Alex. And I'm uh, head of sales at Jigsaw 24, as you may or, may or may not know. I've been around as well. I, I was an editor as well back when I had a real job. These days I talk about um, equipment and get excited about new ways of doing things. But Alex is the real thing. And this is what we wanted to bring to you was an opportunity to talk to and talk, you know, listen to someone who's using this in a real world use case, not just some demo environment. And really evangelize the benefits of what we think is a fantastic um, development that Adobe brought to the market. But I won't waffle on i'll let alex talk about that later what i just did want to talk about a couple of things before we go is we've we've pre-recorded this so alex has essentially constructed um uh, a session which can contains as much as we can possibly get into it uh, and the idea behind pre-recording it is to make sure that we kind of got all of all of the goodness uh, and, and obviously didn't do it live and missed it so um one of the things we've noticed is on zoom excuse me is there are two modes you've got kind of for video not for video Ultimately, we've got it optimized for pitch quality. That may mean that at some points, um, some of the moving video um, interviews or whatever will be a bit choppy. So apologies for that, bear with us. The video will be available in all its glory on YouTube in due course on the channel, on the Jigsaw 24 um, YouTube channel. So if you if you wanted to watch it or you've got colleagues who might um, be interested if uh, you're so bold over all the amazing content that you want to um, evangelize it to them, they can find it on our channel. Um, we've got a Q&A box on the webinar, so if you've got anything that crops up as we're um, going through, please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A box. We'll answer them as we go if we can. Um, we're all, all going to be here the whole time and we'll be here at the end, so we'll have a, a live session. If you want to ask questions, get into it in more detail, ask Alex something specific, uh, you know, that, that's sort of more interactive in nature. Uh, at the end, please feel free to stick around and... Um, We'll, we'll dig into the questions um, in, in detail if you want us to. Um, so just before we start, there, there are two aspects really to this webinar. One is obviously Adobe Productions and how fantastic it is and what a massive improvement it is over projects. Um, the other is that we are running LucidLink, which is a fantastic uh, and transformational technology which allows you effectively to use an S3 bucket uh, in the cloud or possibly one of your own, but typically in the cloud as effectively a universal Thunderbolt drive in the sky, so to speak, which is to say that everybody who's participating in your LucidLink uh, world, and they just need to install the software and attach to your file space, so to do, see on their desktop, and it can be a Mac desktop or you know, Windows desktop or a Linux desktop, by desktop I mean computer, um, they see a drive, a disk, and it looks like you've plugged a Thunderbolt drive in, but in fact, the data in it lives in the cloud and is ubiquitously available. So it's a single source of data truth, in a drive in S3, which is manifested on everyone's desktop. And it's effectively caching the data on the local machine, which allows you to interact with it in such a way that it's a useful work in progress location for editorial, Premiere, any others. Um, so that's what Alex is using here is the underlying technology. So he's got the ability, although we don't really spend a lot of time talking about it, but if, if he wanted to, he would be able to collaborate with any number of people around the country, possibly around the world. Uh, latency notwithstanding. So that's the, the underlying technology. And I'd urge you to have a look at uh, lucidlink.com. There's a free trial. You can go up there and for no money expend, expended, test it yourself. And it is very, very cool. If you're a, someone working in the creative world and you've got the requirement to share media with your colleagues you know, um, over distance, it, it, I would argue it's, it is the, the best way to do it. Without further ado then, 
using that as the background, I'm going to hand over to Alex, who will then introduce himself in a somewhat uh, meta way. Thanks very much. Hi, my name is Alex Snelling. I'm a filmmaker and an editor. And I've been making a documentary for the last seven years called Shoreditch Confidential. And I'm going to spend the next half an hour or so talking about um, using Adobe Premiere Productions and LucidLink um, with, with this documentary. A um, little bit of background. Um, it's been shooting for seven years on all sorts of formats from an iPhone 6 through to um, 4K RAW and everything in between. Um, every sort of flavour of um, HD, um, dog cam, GoPro, drone footage, um, lots of archive, lots of photographs, lots of music, or just, just everything really. Um, it's gone on a lot longer than I intended, which um, I hope means it'll be um, a lot better than I ever intended in the first place. Um, but one of the uh, issues is that sh just the sheer size of, of the media and the project and the, the sort of the whole sort of headspace needed to sort of really approach the editing of it. And I've been getting increasingly worried about how I'm going to approach that editing until I found um, Premiere Productions uh, late last year, last sort of autumn 2020. And I've been playing around with productions and um, it's it's the perfect solution, to be honest. Um, the One of the issues I was getting with, with um, a single Premiere project was just the sheer size of it. Um, getting bogged down with opening it, closing it down with all of this media in. Um, I've got maybe 80 interviews um, with all sorts of different characters and, and they were all in one project um, previous to productions and um, it was getting a bit um, a bit scary to be honest to all your eggs in one basket I didn't want to have to open up everything every single time um, I was um, looking at a bit of footage so um, productions has allowed me to to break it all down and I'm going to show you how I've done that and how versatile it is um, so there's kind of, I think there's three S's, um, that are really relevant when, um, you're looking at the advantages of, um, premier productions. One is speed, um, one is simplicity and, and one is sharing. So, um, we're going to end the, uh, session by looking at how to share projects, um, and productions, um, across the cloud using LucidLink and um, productions um, but first of all just have a quick look at the uh, the bare bones of uh, the production sort of um, structure and then we're going to look at some of the functionality of it and then we're going to end um, looking at the collaboration so let's dive in um, without further ado so I'm going to open up this production here and there it is you can see it's almost an instantaneous open a production basically is just a folder so this is what the my productions folder looks like. So my project is um, it's about Shoreditch, but it's it's divided up into lots and lots of interviews, and I've used um, different basically subject categories to um, divide it all up. So art, fashion, general, hospitality, music. These are all premier projects, and those are all in a folder with inside the productions master folder called interviews. Um, I've got another folder there called sequences. So that's full of projects with different sequences in it. Um, I've also got another folder called main characters. I've got B-roll and this is, this is going to, this is really only just a subset of the um, entire project, but it's already taking up um, 260 gigs. So let's have a look at some of uh, these projects. So let's have a look at this art project. So um, there it is. This is the productions pane here. This is kind of your master control room. And in it, you can see all of your projects. And I can instantly see that I've got one project open, which is called art. Um, that's tagged with a little green pencil that's showing me that I've got it open. You can also see my name there. Um, we'll come 
come back to sort of the collaborative features a little bit later. But here is here is my project. This is basically just rushes, um, interviews. Um, there's no sequences in here. I've divided it up um, into um, sequences in in different projects. You'll see why later. So this this is really just um, rushes. So this is a, a this is a, someone called. Cedric Christie, um, very entertaining artist, sculptor, um, chatting away about Shoreditch. There's another one here that's Darren Coalfield. Um, and we've got a, um, a very beardy Gavin Turk here. I was friends with um, a guy called Joshua So um, this is basically just my rushes. So this, this um, folder here would be uh, created right at the beginning of the, um, the job and added to. Up here, there's a little proxy tag. Um, the top right so all of this media um, has been encoded um, as proxies um, with a little tag here to make it easier to see when you're actually using proxies um, you can see I'm in proxy mode now none of the actual media is actually online so um, I'm working purely from proxies um, which are all stored on lucid links so um, the the master drive which has the the master rushes is not actually attached um, so this is all all proxies as you can see they're pretty good quality um, and that is also streaming from Lucidlink so um, this is the art folder um, this is fashion here um, opens up down there same deal bunch of people all talking about fashion um, or playing back from Lucidlink so Let's just close these two uh, projects for the time being. Let's open up this art sequences um, project. So this is uh, it's the same rushes, but these are different sequences, basically essentially um, sync pulls um, using the rushes. But all of these um, are sequences in here. So I've done a basically a, a rough cut, a sync pull um, for each character from which I'm going to be editing um, editing the story, really, the main story. So I find it a lot, lot more intuitive to work from sub-sequences rather than uh, sub-clips, um, markers, meta-tagging, keywords, whatever. Slightly old-fashioned, some people would say, but I just make master sequences, and you'll see why... Um, this is so powerful a little bit later. Um, so these are all cut up already here. Um, there's Gavin Turk. There you go. And you'll also notice how, how quickly these sequences are opening up and playing. Um, so that's certainly one, one of the things that Productions has above anything is, um, is the speed of working um, compared to the old way. So speaking of the old way, um, let's go over quickly to Niels just to remind you how this would have been arranged um, before productions. Thanks, Alex. Hi, everybody. I'm Niels, Senior Solutions Consultant for Pro Video and Broadcast Workflows at Adobe in Europe. It's exciting to be able to work alongside Alex and show you the productions feature which shipped in Premiere about a year ago now because... We really feel that it's a game changer in terms of the way that you can collaborate with other people or even to manage your own processes and workflows if you're working alone in isolation. Historically, it was quite apparent that Premiere was designed as an editing tool for individual creative professionals. So the process of trying to share that out with other people and then have issues around operating system file relinking and assimilating and coalescing changes made to different copies of the sequence made life really tricky. So I'm working on a local copy of some of the assets from the film, both the projects from within the production and a local copy of the rushes. Um, but the problem I'm faced with first off is if I try and open one of these project, the fashion project, let's say, for example, with those interviews in it, I'm faced with this uh, conflict link media dialogue. So it's telling me that it's looking for the files in the last place it found them, which was actually on um, the relative path to Alex's Mac, and I'm working on a Windows machine. So sure, I can go in, I can hit locate, I can find where those files are on my machine, save over the project and send it back to Alex, but then I've created the reverse problem for him, 
when he goes to try and import it, he's going to be faced with the same error message and back and forth and on we go. So in this case, I've just decided, um, well, I'll tell you what, I, all I wanted to do in this instance was create a basic uh, assembly of some B-roll for the Jay Dolan interview. So I built that instead as just a local project. I ingested the clips that I needed. I've saved out the project with that assembly pull in it. And we're going to reintegrate that into the art project in the production here by re-importing it. So we can do that. Import, find the cutaway assembly that I've created on the desktop, open that up. I only want to import the one sequence, that's fine. But you see here, it's also giving me options for creating a folder for imported items and allowing the import of duplicate media. Well, I don't want either of those things because you know you should be able to track them. They're already in the production. Uh, so I'll leave those unchecked. But when I click OK, what happens is it's going to offer me the cutaway sequence I built. We'll bring that in. And you can see straight away it's duplicated all of those original source rushes and added a new sequence. So you can see that historically working this old way, sending projects backwards and forwards is really something you have to do very carefully. And by using the productions feature, you're going to get around all of these problems because the productions database will manage and take care of all of these reconciliations and conflicts for you. OK, thank you, Niels. Right. OK, so I'm going to now just have a look at um how to work within productions really um, to begin with as a single user. So um, yeah, productions are great for collaborating, but you can also use them as I've just been talking about for organization, which is like the second S, which is simplicity. So you basically use all of these different projects as, as bins. And these projects can be divided into folders as I've done here. And inside of these projects, you can of course have bins but the beauty of keeping projects separate like this is really the speed and the um the reducing the overhead needed to open up um, a project like so bang you've got nothing else to worry about nothing else really sort of impeding the computer that's um a quick look at thumbnail view there's a, there's all the different characters um so let's have a look at doing a quick edit. So let's say someone's asked me to do a quick promo. So I've already got a, um, a project here called promo. So I'm going to open that up and that's actually just, that's empty apart from a, um, an empty sequence there. Um, so I've got a sequence already created and I'm just going to throw a few clips down, um, into that. I'm not going to, um, bore you by forcing you to watch me edit so let's just grab a few of these clips let's um very very quickly let's grab a bit of cedric here and edit him down there a bit of um let's grab someone from another project here let's grab a bit of kath here edit her down there and um let's have a look at some of these old boys here um this old gent used to hang around down um, Brick Lane almost every day. He used to be a real regular, sadly no longer with us. So um, I'm just, just really purely doing this for demonstration purposes. So I've now got um, three, um, three different clips down here in a sequence. And they are from three separate projects they are from uh, this project the boys uh, fashion and art so i'm actually going to close those projects oh, yeah i can click okay see that's closing very quickly and close the boys there and let's have a look inside this project and you'll see there's nothing absolutely nothing in there apart from this sizzle reel so that's all we've got. That's the simplicity, really. Um, that's the beauty of, of working with production. So basically this sequence here remembers where all of the media comes from. 
So what can you do with this media? I'll just to change my view there quickly. Um, you can match frame. So you can match frame in the regular way. It'll give you an endpoint. It'll load up the clip. But notice that it doesn't actually open up a project um, for you to do that. So I can I've got access to the full length of this clip. This is about like nearly a, nearly a fifty minute um, clip here. So I've got access to the full length of that um, without the project where it's stored opening up, which is which is super cool, really, when you think about it. This is Cedric again, same thing. He's like over an hour long, his interview. That's just at all accessible there up in the um, source monitor. And here's his old Nick, same deal. OK, now, if I want to actually open up that project or find out where that project is, I just do a, a reveal in project, just a standard reveal in project. Where is it? Um, somewhere down here, reveal in project. I've got a shortcut running and that opens up the actual project where it's saved. But as I said, you don't actually need those to be open when you're, when you're editing like this. So that's some of the, the very, very simple functionality of um, productions. So basically, I've edited from three different clips into another, um, for three different clips from three different projects into a fourth project here, which I've still got open. Um, yeah, they all, they all work, um, as you would imagine, um, just to give you a little quick um, taster of some other stuff. If I just um, quickly match frame Mick here, I could actually put a marker um, on his on his clip there. So that's an extended marker and I can extend that marker there. This is on the source clip, which is in a different project. So this is actually updating that project without it even being open. So if I open this up now, when I do that and I open up Mick Taylor here, see that's actually saved that marker onto that clip. So when, um, when you've got two separate clips or sequences from different projects, you have to allow, um, allow them to see each other. Um, so that's what's just happened there. So that's now then updated the um, this project here with that marker. Um, but that marker will now, if I click yes to save there, that will now be saved and available for other other users. Which brings me on to um, the collaborative features. So um, all the time that I've been doing this, if we just look up here um, in the B-roll, you'll actually see that there's a little red padlock on this project called time-lapse and there's a name next to it. So that's telling me that Niels has actually got this time-lapse project open. So I can't open it. Or oh, sorry, I can open it, but I can't change it. So I can right click on this and choose open project, even though someone else has got it open. And here it is. So this is my project here. Let's have a look at all the thumbnails. So this is full of uh, time-lapse footage, hyperlapse, great for promos, um, great for music sequences, etc., etc., etc. So this is all in here. Um, and this is currently open and being edited uh, by Niels on a different computer in a different location. So I've just got this as a read only. So that's what that little padlock is telling me. So I can still take clips from here. For example, I can, well, let's find a nice one. Nice bit of dark skies here. Um, let's maybe speed that up, drag it down here. They're talking about dark times as, as, as is everybody these days. So it seems. Um, just resize that slightly. There we go. So that's there. So that's now being edited from 
a project which somebody else has actually still got open. The point is that I can actually cut whilst he's still logging. So um, to see what that looks like on the other side, let's just pop over to uh, Niels and see what he's doing. So I've got this um, bin project open for these hyperlapse clips. So I'm going to do some logging and go through these and um, decide which ones we like the look of. But first, uh, there's 55 shots here. So what I think I might do is um, create some subfolders just to kind of manage what we're doing a bit more. So I'll create a hyperlapse subfolder and a time lapse one. And then we'll put the um, relevant shots into those uh, subfolders. Once we've done that, um, let me take a look through these hyperlapse clips. So you can see I quite I quite like this nice uh, skyline in this one here. So we'll, we'll mark that one as good. And I'm also um, quite drawn to this one here. I quite like this sort of knife, nightlife scene. That's an interesting one. So I'm going to go through and mark up the ones that I like the look of. Three, eight, and I think also 24, that looks good, nightclub shot, and 19 is quite a good one. Again, yep, another nightclub shot there. So we'll just mark all those up. Three, eight, 19 and 24. So now when I save over this bin, then Alex can simply update and uh, reopen this project and see those changes on his system. Okay, thank you, Niels. So now Niels has made his changes. I've still got this project open. So what happens next? So you may notice at the, uh, the top right of the um, project tab here, there's a little exclamation mark. And also in the actual productions pane, there is a italic been put onto the name of the project here. So both of those things telling me the same thing, that this project, it even though it's open as read only on my side, that it's actually been changed. So what do I do? Do I close the project, reopen it again? No. It's as simple as just clicking refresh either here in the productions panel or up here, refresh project. Do that. That loads up the most recent changes made by Niels. And now I could see his folders in the hyperlapse and the time lapse. And I can see his good flags as well in here as well. So Essentially, he's logging away while I'm working. If this is a fast turnaround workflow, that would be very, very useful. It's kind of it's kind of the holy grail, really. So let's uh, let's see if he can actually um, change some of my sequences um, whilst I'm working on them. So let's have a look at master clip effects, which is another um, often overlooked function in um, in Premiere. So let's have a let's open up this art sequences um, project again. Let's have a look here at, um, at Tim Noble. Okay. I certainly want to grade this, but I, I want um, Niels to have a little play around with some grades. So um, back again to Niels. So I've got uh, Tim Noble's interview loaded up here but I can see that uh, Alex has already basically cut it so we've got about four and a half minute edit of his interview here so there's a number of edits in there all, all taken from um, one original source clip that I can I can match frame back to uh, and as Alex says I don't have to have the project open but I certainly can and here it is this is my rushes this is the the master clip that was recorded for that interview Tim Noble so long time ago in Premiere I would have actually had to make a LUT preset and then drop it onto 
all of these clips, but we do um, have master clip effect capability. So in order to achieve that, I can just go to effects um, and I'm going to search for a monochrome uh, LUT ready to put on that original source. Uh, the rushes are here. So I can just pick up um, monochrome faded. If I drag that onto this clip here, that then ripples through, you see, not only to the master clip, but to every instance of it that has been used in Alex's edit of the interview. Um, so again, I can just save over the sequences bin and um, get pass back to Alex for him to see what he thinks. Okay, so uh, thanks again, Neil. So um, yeah, Neil's just sent me a WhatsApp to tell me he's, he's thrown a grade on the, uh, as a master clip effect onto uh, Tim Noble. I've got that open still down here in the timeline, um, but I want to see it on my sequence. So how can I do that? Um, he has changed the uh, clip in its uh, project, which is up here, art. As you can see, he's still got that open, um, but I want to actually see this, okay? So even though I've got this sequence open, um, nothing's happened to my sequence. So the, what I need to do is that I need to actually open this project and allow the two projects to see each other. Um, and you can see, you should have seen that as that opened up, that the every single clip in this sequence is now turned black and white. And sure enough, if I come up to uh, my effect controls here, um, I should be able to see as a master clip effect. Um, that's what we've got going on there on every single clip here. So that effect is being controlled by Nails in real time as I'm working. All I've got to do, if he, if he changes it again, all I've got to do is effectively just click refresh so yeah let's do that let's ask Niels to um, let's say yeah can you make it um, something a little less um, stylistic so back over to Niels okay so a uh, message back from Alex um, he's not feeling the monochrome look uh, for this uh, edit so that's fine uh, loud and clear we can go back to the original source shot and I'll reveal that in the project, open that up in the source bin. When that's highlighted, if I select my effects controls and park that over there, I can now remove that lumetri color. You see that ripples through both to the, to the source clip and to the edited sequence. Uh, and if I go back to effects, um, let's try, yeah, let's try a film stop look, something like a Fuji, um, Fuji F125. That's might be quite interesting looking. Um, I'm going to drop that onto the master clip this time. There we are again, that's rippled through. Uh, and so I can save that um, as well in the sequences bin just to update that uh, and pass back to Alex again. Already held, so I've just seen the exclamation mark appear. I've even got Neil's name in brackets here telling me that it's him that's got the project open and has changed it. That's in italics there. So again, I just click refresh to see what he's done. And hopefully, yeah, that's now updated my sequence. One of the main reasons why I chose productions to, to edit my documentary is, is pancake editing, um, which I love. It's a feature that, um, I just find astonishingly simple, especially if you work with lots and lots of sequence like, like I've been doing here. So let's say I want to use uh, Tim Noble here as a, as a source sequence. So I'm going to close him in the timeline there. In fact, I'm going to close everything apart from my sizzle reel here. But I am going to open up Tim Noble now um, as a as a source sequence so that's opened up I've got a shortcut set to open up a 
sequence as a source sequence into the source monitor and then I've got another shortcut which loads the source sequence into the timeline. So you can tell that by the, the red playhead here. Um, if I go back to the sizzle reel, that's blue, that's red. That's telling me that that's a source sequence. Why is that important? Because I can now take this and put that up there, and this is why it's called pancake editing. So I can take Tim, um, including the master clip effects, and I can choose any of these clips, and I can literally just drag it down into here. And that will take that clip and the master clip effects from this sequence into my sequence. So if we just think about what's happened there, I'm working in this project, um, SC Promo, and this timeline is in there. We've just edited from uh, Tim Noble's sequence, which is actually in Art Sequences, which is um, down here, okay? And the Art Sequences are feeding from this art project here. So that's where the rushes are. So Niels has still got that open. He's, he's still grading away up there, um, which is feeding into the art sequences here. And that is feeding into my master promo here, my master sequence there. So it's kind of cascading um, between three separate projects, um, which is, is just an amazing functionality, but the underlying functionality, the underlying sort of just the paradigm of how it works is really, really simple. So that's Premiere Productions and LucidLink. Thanks for watching. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Alex. That looks really good. There's been a few questions in the Q&A which do merit a chat afterwards. So, um, James, are you OK to do the webinar on Zoom Magic and enable people to talk? Or do we want to hammer away in, in q and I'll start answering the questions I saw in Q&A um, and see if, uh, see if we can actually get live voices in the, in the webinar. Um, so I think um, that's something in the Q&A. Premier settings. OK, so let's start at the beginning, Alex. Could you share your screen and just explain how the proxy workflow works in Premier to kind yeah. of magically make the little blue button appear underneath your player and how you flip back and forth between proxies and live? Um, yeah, and sure. You, yeah, go for it. Um, share, where are we again? Share. I'm just going to go to the, um, the, the playback source because I haven't got Premiere open, but this is the, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, if it's, um, clear um, enough. Yep, we can. This little blue box here is the, um, proxy mode, which you actually have, to, isn't there by default for, for some bizarre reason, because it's kind of almost um you yeah, have to go and hunt it days. if you want it yeah yeah which is this you just add it from this little plus here and you you drag it down along with the multicam those are the two buttons that i use possibly the most but um the the beautiful thing about it is that once you've got proxies set up and created is that it's literally one button click um and in my case in my case my um, online material was was um, local, um, I th as I mentioned in the um, film. That was I actually turned my drives off because they make such a noise, sort of buzzing, that I wanted. The, <laughs> I didn't want that sound to be to occur, but um, I also wanted to make sure that it was actually working. So I was working purely in proxy mode. So I could could have been anywhere on a train working without without a net. Well, yeah, <laughs> um, but. Um, yeah, but once those um, files came back online, um, Premiere remembers where where those files were on my machine, and um, as soon as I click the, the blue button here, um, it just connects. It, yeah. So you can do that, Alex. If I mean, there are a variety of ways you can do that, aren't there? You've got potentially both the primary footage and the um, proxies in LucidLink, and you're you're simply using the proxies because you know you yeah. need the. The, your bandwidth down from the internet and just just to quickly sidebar there with lucid so so the way it works is you've got a thunderbolt drive in the sky clearly the connection between the sky and you is of relevance if you're working at a bit rate so if you've got a 50 megabit down from the internet 
you can work happily with any kind of megabit um, codec up to 50 megabits and it'll work seamlessly. If you're working with 100 megabits, as I was asked in the Q&A, uh, primary files, you can stash those in Lucent Inc. You can put them on the drive, they'll store in the cloud, they're secure, they're you know, redundant, you're using Mr. Amazon's or other S3 buckets to keep them safe. But obviously you've not got a 100 megabit down internet connection. You would use the automatic proxy creation functionality in Premiere, which we could show you, but it's, it's fairly well documented and it's very, very easy to operate. You basically just press the button and now you've got two copies. You've got the 100 megabit original and you've got the six megabit proxy that you've chosen to create. And now if you've got both sets in Lucid, you can switch between the two. One will play happily over your internet connection if it's less than 100 megabits. The other won't play happily, but it is there and can be used to refer to for scenes where you need to see the full resolution. If, however, you're working like Alex, where you've got the proxies on premise, you could have a scenario whereby you've got your office where all your rushes come into. You store your primary rushes on a you know, Nexus or a you know, Promise RAID or whatever it might be that's got the bandwidth for the machine in your office to kind of play full bandwidth. And then you do the you'd create the proxies onto a Lucid drive, which is now available to everybody in the, in the collaborative workflow. But clearly the primaries aren't in Lucid. But if you were to go to the system that can see both the Lucid drive in the cloud or on its you know, mounted on it, and the promise, then when you switch between the proxy modes, uh, when you switch proxy mode, you'll get the, um, the ability to conform at the high res locally. Having said that, if you've got both in Lucid, you've got the primary files and the proxy files, you all of your edits and so on that you've made on the proxies immediately you know, are exactly the same in the primary. So you could essentially render your finished online in, you know, from a Lucid drive but not necessarily be able to play it in, you know, out of the cloud, but obviously you could then download it and put it onto a hard drive locally that had the bandwidth to, to allow you to play it back. But it would effectively be a, a functional, you know, functionally identical to that which you did or had edited with the proxies. Um, so I, do hope, um, I don't know who asked that in the first place. Do you want to let us know? Hold your hand up and let us know. It's Jason. Hi, hi, Jason. Yeah. I, hope, I hope you're well. Um, of a, an old friend i won't say a very old friend that'd be rude but um <laughs> yeah it's um it does it does just seem to work i mean i i don't um i don't tend to use the automatic proxy process in premiere because i like to um control it a little bit more in fact with this i've i've selected two separate proxy settings i've used um quite a nice um mxf op1a um, for most of the interviews, um, which has turned out to be very low bandwidth for, that Neil has recommended to me, um, mainly because of um, the multiple audio streams. And then for, um, you know, the more visual stuff, mainly just video, I just used a standard MP4, which was even smaller. So I quite like to sort of control, control those things rather than just, you know, do it automatically. Um, so I, I, I don't use that automatic proxy process, um, although it is it is really just a simple click once once you've got your footage into Premiere. So um, have I got audio? Yeah, so I'm, I'm still live. So this is my screen I'm just sharing. Hopefully you can see that. Okay. Um, so this is my media demo drive, which you can see on the left hand side here. And that essentially means, um, you know, I'm on a Mac. I've got my various hard drives. You can see my Mac HD, my MacBook or whatever. This is my Lucid drive. And I've got all of these folders here. Now, if, for example, I wanted to work on something, so my media drive here, and, and it's got content in it that is higher bandwidth than my download connection, what I could do is choose to pin that. And what that'll do is it'll essentially force the media down onto my local hard drive so that I can work with it at full resolution. So if you wanted to, you could work with the metadata live. So if you change the name of something you've pinned, that will be reflected to your colleagues who are working with you collaboratively. But the, the kind of source media, the core, you know, the kind of um, the payload of those files would be resident on your local machine and therefore you would get the bandwidth from your local hard drive that you were attached, as it were, if, if you didn't have the internet connection. So a scenario where that might be useful is, is if you've got two colleagues who've got massively good download and they're working at the full resolution uh, and you haven't, but you don't want to make proxies, then you could choose to pin that media onto your machine and everybody's happily working with the high bandwidth media. But personally, you know, the making of proxies is fairly painless. It's very quick. Um, so if you, if you want to do a collaborative edit, I would, I would always recommend using the, uh, 
for the proxy workflow. And actually, while I'm here, um, I'll also talk about, um, let me just share my screen again, the, uh, let's share the whole desktop because it's easier. Um, if I just share my whole desktop, you can see here, this is the icon for Lucid. And there was a question about it consuming your entire internet bandwidth. So here in the settings, um, I've got the control panel. And then down here, I don't know if you can see, I've got various things that I can control. So here we've got the download rate and the upload rate. So for example, if I wanted to um, upload it more carefully, then I would go here and say, do not consume more than um, I don't know, 10 megabits, megabytes per second or whatever my internet connection is. So in that scenario, I've got uploads limited to 10 megabytes and then I can set the downloads, you know, if I'm in a hurry to see it, perhaps to, you know, a bit higher. So I want to play back, you know, material that's up to 50 megabits. So I'd say, okay, download at 50 megabits and upload at 10. Um, there's also here the, the notion of threads. Um, and what that does is essentially open up 64 threads by default, both up and down. And if you leave it to it, if you ask it to, it will saturate your internet connection, which is a good thing if you're, you know, if you want it to. And obviously that means that you don't have to buy things like a spare or Signet or any of the other file, um, you know, fairly expensive file, file transfer apps. You can actually use Lucid Link both as your Thunderbolt drive in the sky, but also it allows you to move data very quickly back and forth between yourself and the central store in the in the cloud. But of course, you've only got one set of data. You're not sending it from you to someone else and they've now got a copy and then you send it to somebody else and they've got a copy and now nobody knows which copy is the real copy. The cool thing about Lucidlink is there's only one copy. It's in S3. Everyone can see it. Everyone can play it. Uh, and obviously, you know, you've got live playback of video that's stored up there. You're on mute. So I'm, I'm mute. I'm muted myself. Classic Zoom. So <laughs> thanks, Julie. Uh -huh. um, can you pause? I'm going to work backwards. So can you pause the upload once it's going? Um, you can, although you don't need to. Once. So basically, how it works with Lucid, if you've got a hard drive cache on your machine, which is it's all encrypted and so on and so forth. But if you copy something to the cache, it happens in real time. It happens as if it's you know, your computer. So things copy. You get the boink on a Mac, and you just carry on. And what happens is it trickles it up according to your upload speed and, and synchronizes the kind of the, 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 the payload into the bucket. What, what happens is the, the file itself becomes instantly visible. So for example, if you make a folder on your machine, everybody around the world sees that folder. If you put a one gig QuickTime movie into your Lucid drive, it, ha you know, it copies instantly or as quick as your machine can copy a one gig file or ingest it onto your Lucid drive. Uh, but obviously, if your upload bandwidth is a tenth of that, it'll take 10 times, you know, real time, as it were, to complete the upload into the, in, in such that everybody else can see it. Now, if it's an MXF file or similar, you can play the file as it's uploading, but you don't necessarily want to pause it. If you, if you shut your laptop and walk away, as long as it's copied to your Lucid drive, that's fine. Next time you hit the internet and open your laptop, it'll carry on uploading. Um, so you, it's, it's very clever. You don't really need to worry about what it's up to. If you shut your laptop while it's still copying, like any copy, it won't survive the trip. But if the progress bar is finished, it's safe. Um, just working back up, streaming media off Lucid, how many layers of video, graphics, etc. So the answer to that is it's all about the bandwidth. So if you're playing back, you know, if you've got a 50 megabit um, file which you're then doing a picture and picture over another 50 megabit file i'm not entirely sure how premier handles that but i imagine it will need both of those to hit the player on your machine so you'll need a slightly higher bandwidth if you've got lots and lots of layers of video i'm going to ask niels is that true niels have i, have I done uh, my video maths yeah, right there or not there are there is an under the hood setting that you can play with um, under guidance um but yeah it'll buffer a few seconds worth in the timeline and expect the, the buffer to be topped up. So if you are working with lots of layers, it's yeah, you probably end up either proxying or working with the pin to, to make sure the footage you needed was available. Cool. So then there's Jason. I think Jason, we talked about that with um, Alex, talked about pin mode, proxy mode. You can either have it do, do it automatically or you can do it yourself. 
I think we've covered everything. Has anybody else got any other questions? If not, I think we're good. And I would just encourage you all to use, as Alex mentioned in the video, use productions anyway. Don't, don't bother with projects anymore, even if you're sitting all on your own without Lucidlink or you know uh, any, any kind of editors to collaborate with. Productions is, is worth getting into because it takes the kind of weight out of the project and puts it into the database. And so all of that time wait, if you've got a lot of media, all of that time waiting to see the, the, the um, um, thermometer kind of check where all the media is goes away when you're working with productions, which is pretty cool. And is one of the criticisms to be fair of, of both of Premiere and Final Cut that I've heard in the past that that's solved by productions. So if that's a frustration of yours, consider it fixed by productions. And with that, I think James, we've covered everything, unless anybody's got any last oh, late breaking questions. Ah, oh, good man, yes, broadcast at jigsaw24.com. That's where we live collectively. Lots of people get hit by that email. Um, if you would like, as I mentioned earlier, to have a go with Lucidlink, go to lucidlink.com, download yourself a test, hook it into the nice people from IBM's storage, all for free, uh, and have at it. It is, frankly, you know, the first time I did it, I spent most of the rest of the day going around the office, forcing people to look at my demo. Um, and I've, I've pretty much not stopped since, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty... It was pretty um, amazing doing it. I don't, there was one moment in the video where I think I showed the amount of proxies that I was using, which was about 230 gigs. Um, and I think at one, which did upload incredibly fast. Um, I think my, my broadband supply might have been um, interested in what I might have been doing at that time. Um, but it, was, it went up there incredibly fast and that was, um, that translated into over four terabytes with the footage, um, hours and hours and hours and hours of footage um, all on the cloud, which is just kind of, you know, all I need to do now is pick up a laptop and connect to that. And indeed any collaborators that you might want to work with worldwide, you know, if, you, if yeah. you've got colleagues internationally, if you're working in proxies, the latency isn't actually that much of a challenge. Um, so obviously you've got you know, data center you need to choose, you know, to kind of hook into, but fundamentally, it means that you've got the ability to work with people. I've, I've done some jobs with, um, we've got colleagues in Glasgow and Cardiff. So we, we put the productions um, you know, in database into a drive on Lucidlink and you know, obviously the media is in one place and we've, we've been happily putting together promo videos with uh, everybody working effectively on the same media. And, the, and as I say, the, the really important thing to take away is it's one set of media in one place with everybody around it being able to access it in a single single source of truth. So it's good. Oh, we can't pause the upload here. Yeah. It just, it, it kind of pauses if you disconnect from the internet, as it were, and then re, re, re um, starts when you reconnect to the internet. So there's no need to kind of manually pause it. If you, if you take the internet away, it stops, it stops uploading. You give it the internet back, it carries on. And I don't know if you can see, I'll quickly share my screen one last time. I'll share the whole screen. So you've got the little icon up here. Um, if you guys look at the very top of my screen, there's like a, what I call a, a carpet beater icon here. Um, and what happens is if it's busy, it has a little green arrow, green up arrow showing that there's media translating up to the internet. And in fact, if you open it up, you, which you don't have to, uh, it'll show you what the remaining upload is. Uh, and obviously it's happy, it's up to date. So I've got excellent internet connection. I'm connected to somewhere in Amsterdam. I've got one and a half terabytes of media in our cloud and um, there's nothing uploading at the minute. It's yeah, it's been no trouble at all, bless it. It's uh, it's quite the most magical bit of technology. In fact, one of our customers, um, when we did a test, described it as witchcraft, which I took as a compliment. Now, uh, more question. Um, Lucidly have a total upload bandwidth cap for all users, no. No, you can absolutely thrash the hell out of it. So if you go to the nice Mr. Amazon, we tested this with a large company who do um, uh, rushes for films like Rogue One and other large Disney outfits. Probably, probably get struck down for mentioning that. Um, and it wasn't Mickey Mouse at all. Sorry. Uh, and, and so, yeah, you, you can absolutely thrash the bandwidth. So we had a gig connection up and filled it. So no, knock yourselves out. If you want to load rushes into the cloud uh, and you've got the bandwidth. What I would say is it's some cloud providers are different to others. You know, some of them are ubiquitous, like the Mr. Amazon, and they charge for it. And you can absolutely saturate your internet connection up to their storage infrastructure. Others who might be smaller, certainly if you build your own in-house S3 buckets, which you can, 
you might not necessarily have the disk bandwidth at the receiving end to fill the pipe um, between the two. But if you've got, yeah, if you're using a storage vendor in the cloud who can handle the incoming speed, then yeah, Lucid don't care, go for your life. In fact, we encourage you to open as many threads as you need. I don't know if you noticed, but when I was in there, 64 is the default, but if you, you know, if you want to fill a hundred gig pipe, then you're going to open up, you're going to need to open a few more threads and go for it. Computing there to be premier settings required for productions. Ah, oh, right, okay. Um, so Alex, do you want to just quickly nip through how you set up a production? Yeah, I missed that question. I d I'm not seeing that. So it, was, it was in the chat, sorry. Man. Oh, right, okay. Um, it's as simple as um, clicking new production and which is in the file menu, just from memory, because I haven't got Premiere open. Oh, okay. and, it, might, and, it might be worth showing Alex the, the structure on the disk itself if you're connected to the Lucid folder. Yeah. Oh, it literally is a set of subfolders on a shared, yeah. a shared okay. um, resource with your other users. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, no, I'm not actually connected to. While Alex is doing that, um, does everyone have to be pointed to the same S3 Geo or can it handle synced S3 buckets? Um, yes, for the moment, but I, I detect a feature request first of the first of the day. Well done. Um, so yeah, that that is potentially geo geosyncing is um, something you can do at the kind of bucket level, but the Lucid link needs to talk to a bucket. So I think that that is going to come, but it's not something that at the moment we can handle. Same thing with things like Glacier. We need to talk to a real S3 bucket. We can't talk to multiple bits of AWS all at the same time, but obviously you can move stuff back and forth. Oh, that's Sorry, Alex, go for it. XMP settings as well, um, I think was also requested. In terms of your XMP sidecar files that live with the media, is that question or? Mm, not sure. Could anonymous attendee um, elaborate on the XMP settings question? And we can definitely answer that. Alex, are you firing up Premiere, mate, or shall I? Yeah, I am. I was just firing up Lucid Link first of all. So oh, <laughs> not that you necessarily would have recourse to go under the hood, um, but you know you can see where the files are. So XMP settings for markers across different machines, I see. Okay, so if you're working on multiple machines using Lucid as your collaborative tool, how would XMP work? Um, the markers are held in the Premiere project until you make an export, at which point they're embedded in new consolidated media or they're created in the XMP sidecar. We don't write to the media it, itself. No, so. but you, you'd, you'd have your project, you'd have your productions on Lucid Link as well. So fundamentally, yeah, quite everything so. you do in, as we, so as in essence, every, everyone's opening. So the whole point of productions, and I'm sorry if we miss this, is everyone opens the same one. So if you've got Lucid Drive, which is available to anybody around the world, and you store your Adobe productions in it, then everyone's opening the same file, basically, in terms of the production slash project, as you understand it, and the media. So there is a single source of truth, quite literally, there's a single source of truth, and that's what everyone opens all at the same time. So you're all in the same Adobe file at the same time, playing the same media at the same time. So the only the only thing you saw is when, when, when Alex was showing you that you've got a name next to which project is open in the production, that's just to say who's got read write. Everyone can have read, but only one person can write at a given time into a particular project. So you might have you know your own sequence projects each so you can happily write your sequences without anybody else getting in the way but obviously everyone reads the rushes bins and so on and so forth alex over to you right i am um, let me share my screen hopefully you can see this so i've got i've just chosen yep, to up. open um a production which is um, I'm choosing as there, which is actually from Lucid Link. And that has opened up. Can you see that? Because I've got two monitors yep. going. Yeah, yeah, no, we, we've got that. So we can see the folders, yeah. So this is my master. Um, Alex, can you do a display with just Can you whip open the finder window that kind of lives alongside yeah. it next door to it? Yeah. Let's open that up. Here's Lucid Link. As you can see, I find at the bottom, I always find this faintly amusing that i've got 1.1 petabytes of storage available 
No, we're just trying to help Amazon out. They could do with it. Yeah. <laughs> it makes you look. So in this folder, which is called Adobe Productions, I've got various things saved in there. And there's a, there's a folder here. So effectively a production is just a folder. If I open that folder, um, it's got one little um, file in it, which is this prod set. And, and that's basically the database that looks after the, all the um, connections between all of these different projects here, um, which are all there. And that is when I open up, all I have to do is direct Premiere to um, that master folder, the, the entire folder, and it opens up like this. Um, so as you can see, if I just close these, I'll try and you can, you can see what's going on there. B-roll interviews, main character sequences. There's a trash as well, which is like a little safety mechanism. So really um, that window, the window on the left is effectively that that kind of document icon, the shared conf 3LL is, is effectively what creates that window and the rest of the projects live inside it. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. It's, ba it's, it's just really a reflection of everything that you've got um, inside of here, except it's also, in addition to that, it's speaking to this file here, which is, um, which controls all of the, um, I guess the uh, read write permissions and so so if you opened up the b-roll project in Premiere there you'll show you get a little lock file don't you to show I think what appears yeah in, in, I will get a um, oh, it's gone onto my other screen now media pending I just make this a bit smaller for the zoom screen I've got a media pending, which is it's. Um, That's cool. We we can live with that. But if, if you if you um, if you go. open the B roll folder, turn down the B roll yeah. folder in the in the yeah. finder window. Oh yeah. Okay. So that's there. There we go. So you've got a little lock icon there that shows that's where and how it keeps track of who's got which project open. So. The lock file is yeah. now telling everybody in the production. Five and them out. If I double click on the building work project, you should see that lock file appear. Um, what, what I say, look at that. This is we're now proving we're really doing this. So good lads. Yeah. Um, so we got some. So, so Alex, if you just so this is one production. So I'm, I'm at the risk of nailing the Neil, this live demo. If you were creating a production from scratch. Can you just show? I mean, it's in the. I know it's in the file menu, and it's easy. Yeah, can you just quickly prove that. Prove how easy it is. Yeah, you can't have uh, more than one production open at a time, so I'll have to close that. And I'm then gonna trust Niels. He was like, literally, just go um, new production. Um, let's just call this. Um, choose Jesus somewhere to test. store it. Um, it's going to go by default onto Lucid Link. Um, it gives you one free sequence, and like a free set of batteries. Um, let's just call this Thursday. Sequence included. One sequence, in, uh, one project, sorry, not, not sequence. Yeah. And that, that um, is, to be fair, Alex, one of the baffling things when I first started new product, using productions was the idea that I had projects all over the world, particularly as I'm an old avid head, and I come from a land of bins. I yeah. found you know, the idea that a project kind of roughly equates to a bin was a bit of a mind bender to start with, but I've kind of got over it now. Pretty much so, yeah. And and you can and you can have projects inside folders. So you've got a production which has then got folders inside it, inside which live projects. Yeah. In, I mean, I really, I really, I really like the way you, you you've got sequence projects. So you know, like I would have a sequence bin as it were. So I, I like the way you segregate the rushes and the sequences and so on. But fundamentally, you've got as many projects as you need, haven't you, in a production? Yeah, I don't. I don't think there's a limit because it's really just a very very um simple um file structure isn't it of, yeah. neil should be able to give us more yeah, info yeah well i i mean because we sort of invented the concept of a production after the fact of what a project was you you can should you wish yeah so you've kind of gone you, you've bin. kind of gone to a level well, haven't a you because you've got a production yeah so you and you could put a bin inside of a project so you've kind of almost got another layer yeah i'm used to i think that's where where i'm kind of i was originally struggling but it, obviously you've got a huge amount of flexibility within that structure it's like inception 
there's a bit. So we've got a question, how would you recommend exporting a project where the footage of project is on Lucid Link? Would Lucid Link still be clever with the cash base and export directly to your local cash? Or would it struggle and your upload bandwidth become a bottleneck? Um, exporting a project, as in the whole project? I mean, you just copy it. If you're talking about exporting video, um, then yeah, you, you, it, it just comes down as fast as your internet. So if you're rendering it out, or sorry, if you're doing file export from Premiere, um, it would be, uh, yeah, as quick as your internet. I don't know whether if you've got a 50 megabit download, is that faster than your hard drive? Typically, most hard drives copy at about 30 to 40 megabytes per second. Yeah. SSD is a bit quicker, obviously. So there's a number of variables in that question, but the answer is no magic needed, really, I think. I'm not, have I missed the point? Whether it refers to the Lucid Link cache or the Premier cache as well. Mm. The Premier cache I've lost it now. Where's, where's the chat gone? There it is. Sorry. Um, how would you recommend exporting? Yeah, so I'm not sure. Could you, could you, um, sorry, Billy, could you explain what you mean by exporting? If you're still here. We've gone on a bit longer than planned, so apologies for that. I hope it's been useful. I feel a bit like I'm, I'm in a seance waiting for Billy to knock once for yes or twice for no. Uh, it's it's it. Take it offline, it's not. Yeah. Oh, he's back. Well done. Sorry if that's unclear. File export. Yeah, so an MP4 file. Yeah, so let's assume you've chosen to export a 30 megabit MP4 file, or possibly not that big. Um, yeah, you won't, it, it, it'll be immediate. You know, there's no There's no delay. So if, if, you're, if the file you've chosen to export has a bandwidth that's lower than your download, it'll be faster in real time. The cache is invisible. Um, you, you'll never even know it's there. Uh, people get very obsessed. The minute I say cache, people start exploring it. You'll never notice the cache. Uh, you, really, you really won't. It's a trampoline. The data trampolines backwards and forwards between the cloud, but it's invisible to you, the user. And you can make the cache as big as you like. You can make the cache as big as one of Alex's promise drives if you want, but you don't need to. We generate it at about five gigabytes uh, and put it on your local hard drive. Um, you can put it where you like. You can have it as big as you like. Um, but it's just a portal to teleport your data to and from the cloud. You really won't know it's there. Has a commercial close to use this? Do you have an example of how the production's organized from the unscripted broadcast project? Um, yeah, broad, goodness me, commercial post houses, broadcasters. Um, my favorite editor in the world, Trevor Aylwood, as I noted, I can't help noticing he's on ever the, um, the Adobe premier editors of Facebook, he's, he's I'm afraid he, he appears to have abandoned Avid and he is a big sports, you know, professional editor. He, he's one of the guys I, you know, have always rated professionally and he's, he's a big premier man um, and he uses productions all the time. I don't know, Niels, do you want to talk about commercial post houses using productions and um, unscripted broadcast projects? Does Walter Merch count? I don't know. Uh, queuing, queuing you up. Sadly came too late for his big uh, premier outing, unfortunately, but um, uh, huge use amongst the Netflix community in Hollywood. Uh, this was kind of um, pardoned by our. Um, did Fincher? Did Fincher use it on uh, Mind Hunter or not? Yes. Uh, on, on no, on Mank. On oh, Mank. Sorry, yeah, the latest yeah, feature. So that, that was a so productions fest. That's yeah. not obviously that's not an unscripted broadcast project. I'm, I'm not allowed no, to admit. So no, unscripted broadcast it project to your so it, Candidly, it doesn't actually lend itself particularly well to things like growing files. Um, as a sort of first use case, so it is. It, it's sort of you know, it has long form doc feature drama. Um, yeah, I mean, if if it's if it's designed to answer a criticism, then I'm probably going to get excommunicated by the Adobe community here. You know, for a long time, you know, the avid guys are going, you can't use Premiere, mate. It's rubbish for long form and you know, blah blah blah. This this movement of the management of the data from the project into the productions allows you to go toe to toe with your media composer, kind of, you know, it organizes the media, it kind of take, takes care of business in the background. That's that's absolutely where this is aimed at. And so it's those guys who've got massive timelines, shitloads of media. That's that's where production starts to sing. Yeah. Um, but I would encourage everyone to use it pretty much all the time, apart from as as Charles uh, Neil said, if you've got live ingest, you know, if you're doing an edit while playback type of project, that might not necessarily be you know, the ideal kind of first project. Right, I, I could waffle on, on. I, could, I could waffle on afternoon. I think we've probably used up enough of your time. So we've, we've certainly over, overstayed our um, original plans at that time. So I think, um, I don't think there are any more questions. No, I think we're all good. I think we're gonna take 
take that as a wrap if everyone's happy and thank you very much indeed for your time this will all be on youtube in due course if you either want to relive it or you want to recommend it to a friend we'd appreciate it if you did oh I'm, i could nearly do it i'm too old to be youtube i'm not going to do click and subscribe or anything like that um, <laughs> but, uh, i'll uh, i'll leave it at that thanks very much for your time guys and um look forward to meeting some of you irl at some point yeah cheers. one day soon thanks bye cheers everyone okay thanks a lot